and welcome to Finnish Training Solutions Anatomy Series Part 5. So today we're going to look at the nervous system and its relation to exercise. So what is the nervous system? What are the learning outcomes we are looking for today? So hopefully you'll be able to describe the role and function of the nervous system. The principles of muscle contraction again because we're going to look at that again in terms of the nervous system and it's going to give you a little bit of a better understanding to re recap that section. Hopefully you'll be able to describe the all or nothing law um, and its role in motor unit recruitment and describe how exercise can enhance neuromuscular connections and improve motor fitness. So just a little thought storm there. Call out all the names of anything you may know relating to the nervous system. Obviously, you can't shout them out, and I can't hear you, but if you want to jot them down for me, that'd be perfect. Um, pause us now, and then come back. Okay, so hopefully, you were shouting out lots of things in your room, and you sounded a bit crazy, but that's absolutely fine, because it's all a learning curve, and we're about taking on more information and more knowledge. So you were probably shouting out the brain, the nerves, the spinal cord, muscle contraction, stress all or nothing law, peripheral nervous system, somatic nervous system, hopefully you were sharing that stuff like that. So the function of the nervous system, so what is it all about? So it's the main control and communication center of the body. It's responsible for maintaining homeostasis of the internal body. So homeostasis is our body's balance to keep control. Provide the electrical stimulus that triggers skeletal muscle to contract. And it's important to understand that the structure of the nervous system has two main for the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, so the PNS, which is the nerves that lie outside the spinal cord. So we've got sensory nerves and motor nerves. So let's start with the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system is like the messenger that sends all the information to the brain, and then the brain decides what's going to happen with that and sends a signal back out for the peripheral nervous system to do what it needs to do to get the body to maintain homeostasis. So we have autonomic system, which controls involuntary functions such as digestion. That's the autonomic system. It's subdivided into somatic nervous system as well. So the two subdivisions are somatic nervous system, which controls voluntary movement, such as skeletal muscle, so it helps us when we're standing, walking, and lifting a weight. And then the autonomic system is everything internally, such as hormones. So the role of the nervous system, the main role of the nervous system is to gather information, the sensation, analyze, and interpret the information that's coming in, and then initiate the appropriate response or action. So the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, so the neural sensors throughout the body collect information regarding the internal and external environment, then send information to the CNS, central nervous system, via sensory nerves. The central nervous system will then analyze the information from the sensory nerves of the PNS system, then interpret and interpret whether response is required. Responses are sent across the body by motor, motor nerves. So it works like this. So nervous system summary, sensory receptors gather a, a stimulus to the PNS. Action potential along the, the nerves. The brain or spine interprets the signals. And then an action potential along a the nerve. They target an organ or muscle response. So it looks like this. So the information from the PNS system is a stimulus and a receptor. Sensory neurons go through the spinal cord and then goes out via the motor unit or the effector. And that's what the response will be. So to give you a bit of a breakdown, so I'll bring this back a stage. When you're looking at the peripheral nervous system, as you can see, 
I take my laser pointer. You find that something happens. For example, this say you touch the hot surface with your hand. That hot surface would send the signal via the sensory nerves, via the peripheral nervous system to the brain. The brain would then decide what happens. For example, it's hot. It sends the signals back out via the efferent nerves. So it goes via the afferent nerves into the central nervous system of the peripheral nervous system, it goes into the brain, and then comes out via the efferent nerves of the peripheral nervous system to tell you what the action is. So for in this case, it wants you to lift the hand off because the hand is as a hot surface. Now this should be in your consciousness. So this should be somatic. So this would be a somatic response. Whereas an autonomic response would be, for example, if you were getting nervous or you were having an argument with someone, the body would find that your heart rate is increasing. So the peripheral nervous system via the afferent nerve sends a signal to the central nervous system that says, you know, you're, you're having an argument with someone and it's getting heated. What the brain would then do is send a signal via the efferent nerve of the peripheral nervous system to the internal organs and say, adrenaline, I need you to release some adrenaline via the adrenal. So it'd say adrenals. So it goes to the adrenal glands and it'd say, right, I need you to release an adrenaline. And this will increase your fight or flight response and then help you react in a certain manner. Hopefully your flight and not fight, because um, we don't contain uh, condone fighting at Fitness Training Solutions. Um, but that's an idea. I'm going to go into more detail in the central nervous system and the nervous system itself um, at level three. Um, and I've also got a video online as well that you can check check out for more details on that. Okay, so. Get rid of my pointer. So what we're we looking at now. So can you remember any of the key principles of muscular contraction? So remember we looked at the slide in filament theory. Can you think of what you had to do? Let's see if you can write some stuff down. Jot them down now, just to see if you can have a quick recap. Okay, so the key principles of muscle contraction. Muscles cross joints, they attach to bone, so origins and insertions. Voluntary control by the nervous system, they work in pairs, so agonist and antagonist. And then we were looking at the slide and filament theory as well in the last section. They contract to bring about movement, so you were looking at the all or nothing law as well. So here you can see the myofilaments contracted. So that's when it's relaxed and that's when it's contracted. So what is a motor unit though? So an individual motor unit is composed of a group of muscle fibers, a motor unit that stimulates these fibers. So as you can see, there's the motor unit there, the muscle fibers, you've got the motor neuron and the branches of the motor neurons that branch onto there to activate the muscle fibers. So here's a motor neuron itself. So you've got the dendrites, which is, uh, they collect signals. And then you've got the axon, which passes the sig signal, and then the myelin. And then you've got the muscle fiber itself and the neuromuscular junctions to which you can activate. So the all or nothing law, so firing a nerve with a motor unit will generate a stimulus to fully contract all of the associated muscles. The motor unit is either on or it's off, and there is no partial stimulus or contraction of a motor unit or its fibers. So motor units themselves, one long-term adaptation to resistant exercise is the recruitment of more motor units. This adaptation will generate greater force and strength of the muscle contraction. Early improvements in strength are often due to the recruitment of more motor units and improved neuromuscular connections. So the whole use it or lose it theory. If you use your muscle and you keep working it through the motor units, 
it will help you generate greater force and greater strength. So neuromuscular adaptations to exercise. So for example, for aerobic and endurance events, so type one muscle fibers develop, they're gonna increase size and the number of mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. They're like your batteries. Increased oxygen delivery to the muscle fibers. Increased aerobic enzymes within the muscle tissue. A greater supply of glycogen and triglycerides for energy. And improved tissue tolerance and resistance to fatigue under aerobic conditions. Now the neuromuscular adaptation to exercise for strength training, or we would call type two muscle fiber development, would be a decreased nervous inhibition, increased thickness or diameter of recruited muscle fibers. So we know that as hypertrophy, so muscle growth. Increased forced production capacity for muscle fibers, increased tissue tolerance and resistance to fatigue at the highest stress anaerobic conditions. Neuromuscular connections and motor fitness. So what do we know? So skill related components of fitness include balance, coordination, speed, power, agility, and reaction times. P specific type of exercises will enhance neuromuscular connections and improve motor fitness. Now, I'd like you to think and spend some time thinking about the type of activities that are skill related components of fitness that would help motor connections and motor fitness. Well, we've come to that part again. Hopefully, you'll be able to describe the role and functions of the nervous system, describe the principles of muscle contraction, describe the all or nothing law and motor uh, recruitment. Describe how exercise can enhance neuromuscular connections and improve motor fitness. If you today follow our anatomy and physiology series, there'll be more information online. You've also got use of your manuals as well, and you can always drop us an email. I'm Ben, thank you very much.